everybody, it's your boy GS Luke here with our DFS core picks for this week's Genesis Scottish Open. We'll be touching on my top six GPP plays priced $8,000 and above on DraftKings and I'll be building a majority of my lineups around. Now some of these players might be a little bit chalky but given how well the model this week and the key stats that I'm looking at for my analysis, they're going to be smash plays and I'm having a hard time avoiding. And just to review last week before we hop on in, we had five of our six picks make the cut last week, but most importantly, guys like Scott Stallings, Maverick McNeely also had a solid week, Cam Davis all finished in the top 10. Patrick Rogers was a top 10 fantasy scorer with his three Eagles and a hole in one. And even guys like Brendan Todd made the cut Got the job done in most of those small field GPPs. The one large dud was Cameron Champ, which I guess was to be expected with how volatile he can be. I told you he'd probably either win this event or miss the cut by six strokes, and he pretty much went out and did that. So not really going to be a surprise from my end, but in general, a pretty solid performance, especially when we consider I was well over the field on guys like Christian Bzainhut, Emiliano Grillo, guys like Denny McCarthy, Chucky Three Sticks, Mark Hubbard. So we had plenty of players in the top 10, just not enough of JT Post, and of course, somebody I absolutely love, have talked up a lot here on the channel. Just last week, I thought he was a little bit too chalky. I thought that run of play was going to come to an end, and oh boy, was I wrong. But in either circumstance, when you have all those guys there in the top 10, it's going to be hard to lose money. It was a slightly profitable week for me, just kind of treading water once again, but uh, the modeling was spot on. Most of our picks were there. Just need to get those chalk pieces right week to week to take down the big bucks. So with that being said, really excited to hop into this week's picks. Let's go ahead and get this thing rolling. I've got my projections on the screen, and as per usual with these videos, going to start off with a look at the key stats. So we've got the Renaissance Club, which technically is a Lynx style golf course, but a little bit closer to a Parkland style American setup than most of these quote unquote Lynx style setups. So first off, a Tom Doak design, and the key stats I'm looking at look a lot more like a birdie fest than it does any other golf course, and that's because the scoring dictates that. We've had winners of 20, 22 under par over the last three years, and though one of them was at 12 under, that was certainly an outlier. There was plenty of wind that year, also rain in two of those rounds. So in terms of what I'm expecting this time around, Definitely something in that 20 to 25 under par range. So not a surprise to see shots gained approach at the top of the board. If I'm going to have any type of a stance there with approach, it is going to be a long iron play though. The 175 to 200, also the 200 plus yard range, going to be my key points of emphasis there, but also birdie or better percentage. Of course, at a birdie fest, shots gained off the tee. Taking a look at distance over accuracy, but past that, shots gained putting is important at these courses with a low winning score. Also, looking at comp course history, par 5 and par 3 scoring with one extra on the docket for a far 71, and also 3 putt avoidance with relatively large greens. Now, something to note here is that yes, the weighting column has been blacked out, as has a lot of the rest of the sheet. Now, of course, I talked about this going forward last week is I'm going to be censoring some of my content. Of course, my Patreon page is where I post all of this for my subscribers. And frankly, I think they need to be getting more out of the picks, right? Not everybody should be getting access to my modeling, to my projections, projected cut rate, all that sort of fun stuff. So what we're going to do with the content here on forward is just restricting it to the guys that I'm featuring. If you are looking to access everyone's modeling, everyone's projections, so on and so forth for the field. Make sure to go ahead and sign up there. First off, you get access to these, but more than that, you get one-on-one -on -one coaching from me, access to the GS Luke Discord, where you can interact with the rest of the members there, bounce any questions you have, not just off of me, but also a lot of those other great minds. So definitely recommend checking it out. And in the future, I'm going to have a shots gain database I'm posting online in website format, and also probably a lineup builder. So a lot to come on that front. And uh, again, if you're looking for access for everybody in the field, not just the guys, the six guys I'm touching on in this video, that's how you can go out and do so. And the shameless plug aside, let's start with our first core pick, which is going to be Scotty Scheffler at the top of the pricing board. So $11,200, you are certainly paying for the world's number one player. But at this specific event, he checks all the boxes I'm looking for, which just to remind ourselves, 
Shots gained approach was our number one key stat, right? Birdie or better percentage, and then shots gained off the tee. So if we take a look at the last 24 measured rounds, oh, let's look at it. Shots gained approach, checks that emphatically. We look at his birdie rate. He's top five on the PGA Tour, which for the world's number one player, somebody who's won five times this year, that shouldn't be a surprise. And then, oh, one of the world's best off the tee players, right? Absolutely stripes it off the tee. One of the longest players we have here on the PGA Tour and certainly gets it done with his distance over his accuracy. So checks all of those boxes emphatically. And in terms of course history, he's one of the few players that's actually played here. So had a 12th place finish in 2021 at the Scottish Open. And the recent form, though it hasn't been flashy, I mean, people are getting upset because he's finishing top 15, right? Top 13 at the Travelers, second at the U.S. Open, top 20 at the RBC Canadian, another runner-up the Charles Schwab. People want to forget about Scotty Scheffler and, frankly, make him much lower owned than he should be just because he hasn't won four or five straight events, right? So I think people are being a little bit unfair when it comes to Scotty's game because when we take a look at the last 50 measured rounds, it's outstanding, right? Gaining a ton in every shot's gain category, really not a hole that you can poke in his game. So week in, week out, he continues to be much lower owned than he should be. I mean, the world's number one player coming in as my number one model ranking should be a 25, 30% owned this week. And you're probably going to get something like 17, 18% on a Scotty Shuffler, which is certainly something that I'm willing to invest in. Next up, we've got really a range I love. So from Sam Burns the whole way down to Victor Hovland, these four guys I have marked down are going to be among my favorite plays on the slate because obviously they have a ton of upside, but even more than that, their price makes them extremely easy to plug into lineups as you know, if you start with one of these guys, you can take all four of them if you wanted to. But even if you take a Scotty Scheffler, they're very easy to fit in as a second man in. So for me, Sam Burns at 9200 bucks, a top 10 model ranking is certainly somebody I have my eye on because just like a Scotty Scheffler, he's got the off the tee play we're looking for, explosive power in that department, a high birdie percentage player, also top 10 on the PGA Tour there, and a putter that can get hot in bunches. And of late, that's kind of been what's holding him back. So if we take a look at that, he's been great in that category over the last 24 rounds. But at his last event, he only gained a half a stroke in that category. And for Sam Burns, that's not going to cut it, particularly when he lost over a stroke and a half around the green. So with that being said, he didn't have his best stuff ball striking either. It was his first pitch cut for quite some time. So I expect him to be much lower owned this week than what we've seen over the last month because before that, it was a top 27 finish at the US Open, top five at the RBC Canadian, obviously won the Charles Schwab, top 20 at the PGA, was also solid for Sam Burns. You know, the last time we got him low owned, was at the PGA, right, right before he went on that run. And that was because he missed the cut at the Byron Nelson. So at his price tag, I think if he was coming in without that missed cut, you'd be looking at like 25, maybe even 30% owned Sam Burns because he would be completely mispriced. But with that on the docket there, I think maybe we get 14, 15% owned Sam Burns, something that's a lot more reasonable, something kind of similar to what we have with Scotty Scheffler. And like I said, whether you look at the last 24 rounds or the last 50 measured rounds, it's absolutely outstanding for the LSU product, gaining over half a stroke per round on approach, close to two, sorry, three quarters of a stroke per round with the putting, just exactly what we're looking for, an explosive extremely aggressive player who can make birdies and bunches and i know it's a link style setup which you know you don't think of sam burns when you think of that type of setup but like i said it's a little bit of a hybrid link setup where you have some of that birdie or better percentage coming into play but also a little bit more of a parkland style look on at least 10 to 12 of the holes here next up we've got cam smith another absolute madman right high birdie percentage player um, another top 10 birdie maker on the pga tour but even more so than the other two this guy i believe is number he's number two on the pga tour right now to justin thomas and birdies per round a lot of that is due to the putter which he can get working in a hurry but of late it's been the approach play it's been his ball striking so if we take a look at the stats over the last 24 rounds he's getting 1.1 strokes per round with the approach play absolutely outstanding the putter he's just a slight positive in fact over his last few starts has lost with the flat stick and that's why the recent form has been quote-unquote disappointing right a miscut at the u.s open a 48th at the rbc canadian a 13th at the memorial oh no right he's finishing in the top 13 these two finishes he's become that 
forgotten man there. And we have to remember, just a few months before that, he was winning events. He was posting top five, top tens every single time. Won at the players, won at the tournament of champions. You're talking about a player when he's on his best game, who's borderline unbeatable. And at Birdie Fest specifically, I mean, we saw it at the tournament of champions. He can run away from the field because the putter can get that hot. So at $9,100, you know, him and Sam Burns check a lot of the same boxes. And you can see the modeling is similar on both players, right? He's number nine in my modeling. You have Sam Burns there at number 10. So it's not like they're drastic values, not like they're number one or two in my modeling. And they're at number, you know, nine and 10 in the pricing, but still solid for their price tag. And given the fact that they have the firepower to take this to 20 to 25 under par, I think they have the actual outright upside as well. So I like them there at that price tag, both of them very solid options. And I don't think either one is going to be low owned. In fact, I think both of them are going to be in the top five to 10 in terms of ownership on the week, but I think well warranted. I think they give you enough flexibility by taking them um, as a second man in, as opposed to somebody like a Xander Shoffley or Patrick Cantley, that you can be a little bit more balanced with the rest of your lineups and the marginal differences in terms of ownership I think are well worth making the pivot. Moving down a little bit further, we've got Jordan Spieth and also Victor Hovland we'll talk about here in a second. But just like the last two plays we talked about, high birdie or better percentage type of players, especially with Jordan Spieth, that can get it working in a hurry. And Jordan Spieth loves himself a link setup. So unlike the first three players, if you are buying into that type of narrative, then Jordan Spieth should be speaking to you because he's, of course, won the Open Championship, was there in contention last year at Royal St. George's, and loves himself Pebble Beach, which, though it's not a pure link setup, neither is this course, right? It's also a hybrid type of golf course, an American Lynx, if that's going to be such a thing. So taking a look at the comp courses, I like what I'm seeing there. But even more than that, the shots gain metrics have been unbelievable for Jordan Spieth. So gaining over 0.6 shots per round in all the categories we're looking at from tee to green. And then with the putter, he's finally got it to a neutral. And now you might say, hmm, a neutral, that's not very good for Jordan Spieth. Well, he was losing over half a stroke per round putting the, over the last 24 rounds just a few events ago. So clearly has got it working in the right direction. And from tee to green is arguably the best player in the world, right? He's the most balanced player. You know, he might not be gaining 1.1 strokes per round on approach, but he's gaining significantly in all three tee to green categories. And like I said, with this golf course, you know, we like the approach play, but like off the tee play, the only thing we're really hunkering down on is scoring ability. And if there's magic being somebody who can take a course to seven to eight under par, just based on chipping in, you know, hitting shots of two to three feet, that's Jordan Spieth, right? We love him at these birdie fest courses where you have to have that firepower. Jordan Spieth has firepower unlike any other player. The course history is where it starts to drop off. He actually hasn't played here before. Same thing for Camp Smith. I guess it's worth noting that Sam Burns did play here last year and finished in the top 20. So that's something that we can put in his book. But for somebody like Jordan, same thing with Victor Hovland. They have not played here before. So I don't think that's enough to keep people off of him, but perhaps the missed cut at the Travelers is, and you can probably see a little bit of a recurring theme here, right? Scotty Scheffler, quote unquote, bad form because he hasn't won in his last five starts. Sam Burns missed cut. Cameron Smith missed cut his last time out. Jordan Spieth missed cut. Same thing with Victor Hovland. So though all of these plays make sense from the stat perspective, I don't know if they're going to be chalk. They're coming in off these quote unquote bad performances and people love to scoreboard watch, particularly the casuals that make up most of the contests for these large field GPPs, the people that don't do in-depth research, that look at the stats like you and me. And I know, you know, there'll be touts out there that talk up these players. Again, that's still a small majority of the field. So I've already, you know, talked over these plays with a few people and people have said, you know, oh, they're going to be quote unquote chalk. I'm not so sure about that, right? They're coming in off missed cuts. So, you know, somebody like a Jordan Spieth who's gaining in bunches in all those categories. We're going to talk about Victor Hovland here in a second at $8,800. I think they make plenty of sense, particularly Victor Hovland, whose only issue has been around the green, right? He's losing close to half a stroke per round around the green. This is a birdie fest. We're not going to worry about that, right? If he ends up making a few extra bogeys because of the around the green play, so be it, because he's a world-class player in every other category. One of the straightest drivers of the golf ball, which should be very advantageous around the Renaissance Club approach. We know he's one of the best iron players on tour. With the putter, he's been hot of late, gaining close to half a stroke per round. Take a look at the last 50 rounds, which again, for Hovland, he's been in a 
a quote-unquote bad stretch of golf is an even more significant gainer in both ball striking categories and the putter remains. So like I said, he's just got to go out there, kind of do his thing this week, which is hit plenty of greens, set up plenty of birdie opportunities, and add a golf course where you can kind of get away with not having the best chipping game, you know, game from 50 yards in. I think that plays directly into his skill set. So he's at $8,800, the cheapest we've seen Victor Hovland, I believe, in at least the last year in PGA DFS. This is a chance that I'm just, you know, wanting to pounce on. You know, usually I'm talking him up as a fade, right? Because at hard golf courses, I don't think he can stack up. You just haven't seen it to this point of his career. But when we get him at a birdie fest, a course that I think is going to play easy, I am all about playing Victor Hovland, particularly if he's going to be low owned because he missed the cut at a hard golf course. No crap, he did. We expected that going into the week. So certainly something that I'm looking to leverage there. Like I said, no course history, just like a Cam Smith or a Jordan Spieth. The recent form, he also has the missed cut, but a few other made cuts, right? Made cut at the Memorial Charles Schwab PGA Championship. So it hasn't been all that bad. And people, you know, will look at the missed cut for Jordan Spieth and be like, oh, he's in horrible form. Oh yeah, let's forget about the second place of the Byron Nelson, the top 10 of the Charles Schwab, the top 20 of the Memorial. Oh, oh the win at the RBC Heritage just about two months ago, right? Um, I think a lot of the recent form box score watching is what drives a lot of the ownership here. And uh, oh boy, do I hope it keeps ownership low on a few of the plays that we just talked about. And now lastly, the last pick we'll get to here is going to be Max Homa at $8,000. He comes in as my number four ranked play this week, which is ridiculous at $8,000. And he's also coming in with solid recent form. So if we take a look at that, he doesn't have that missed cut on the schedule. So I do expect Max Homa to probably be chalky here, but a 50th place or top 50 at the US Open, top five at the Memorial, a couple top 25s before that, and a win at the Wells Fargo Championship. So in terms of his recent form, especially the recent form metrics, you'd probably expect this guy to be at least $9,500, but he's there at $8,000. So even though he will be chalk this week, and I can tell you, Max Homa, probably at least 20% owned there, I think it's well worth eating because first off, he's a birdie maker, one of the more aggressive players we have on tour, and he's gaining across all four stat categories. There's literally not a hole to poke in his game. If you take a look at the course history, he hasn't played here before like some of the other players. The recent four metrics, we looked at them, they're solid, and if you just you know, try to find any narrative of all to try and fade Max Homa, it has to be ownership based, right? He's gaining across all four categories, high birdie percentage player. Every key stat I have on this list here, he's a significant gainer. The only one that can really draw him back is when you take a look at some of his link stats, you know, how he's played at open championships, for example, um, has not really been his best self. It hasn't really played on those golf courses all that often. So I think that would be the one thing to hold against him. But outside of that, checks every box that I'm looking for. And as long as he's not 30% plus owned this week, he's going to be somebody I feature in quite a few lineups. Alrighty, that's all I've got for this week's core picks. Before you hop on out of here, let me know in the comments who you think ends up winning this week. For me, it's a tough choice. I don't want to take Scotty Scheffler because, duh, I think the world number one player is going to win. And outside of that, let's go with Jordan Spieth. Let's be a little bit more creative. Think a little bit outside the box. I'm going to take him at 23 under par. But go ahead and let me know in the comments who you're taking in. Perhaps what you think the winning score is going to be too. But outside of that, I appreciate all your support here. Make sure you smash that like button. You will have the full slate of content dropping throughout the week. So whether it's our value plays, our weekly DFS live stream, on Tuesday for our betting picks at 7 p.m. Eastern Time or on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time for our DFS live stream. Make sure you stop on by and, of course, if you haven't already subscribed to my channel here, first off, what are you waiting for? But make sure you go ahead and do so so you don't miss any of that content when it drops. Again, I appreciate all the support. You guys stopping by and consuming this type of content. Best of luck with all of your contests, all of your betting slips for this week, and let's get this cash, fellas.